Right. Ha. Yes. So, rules should always empower and they shouldn't overpower. I mean, it goes without saying, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right, good. Glad we had that one. Uh, you can go now and do whatever it is that you were you were doing. Um, yes, good. Right, fine. Thank you. Okay, right. Yes. Right, yes, good. What? <laughs> Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Campaign Creator Series. My name is Guy and we're finishing off the Amazulu cycle, although now we call them the Darkini, so we're almost going to drop that whole Zulu reference altogether. We've used them for our inspiration, but now we need to translate that into something actionable, something actually tangible that players could potentially dig their teeth into because maybe they want to play a Darkini, maybe they want to join in this world that we're creating, hopefully, thumbs held that that's what happens. And ultimately, that's what we want this to achieve. We want to get to the point where our players want to be these races that we're creating. So how do we translate that from the idea space into the actual usable space? And to do that, we're going to use today's sponsor. Today's sponsor, of course, is World Anvil. WorldAnvil.com, that wonderful creator series series, I should say. This is the series that you're watching where we're going to be using World Anvil today specifically to translate our race from idea into something that our players can get their hands on. Now, if you use the code GREATGM, you'll get a discount on a subscription to World Anvil. There is a free version which you can use straight off the bat. Now, why are we going to use World Anvil or why are we going to use some kind of tool to commit to paper or to digital paper anyway, our idea? Well, we've got to have it down somewhere. And we need to make sure that it's presented to the players in such a way that it's actually usable. There's no point in having this wonderful thing up in your head and no one else being able to actually use it. So we've got to, we've got to commit it down somewhere, whether it's on paper, whether it's in World Anvil or whatever world building software you choose to use, we need to do that somehow. So this is, this is what we're going to be doing today. Now, where do we start? Well, we use what's called an inverted pyramid. An inverted pyramid. This is an idea that comes from journalism, but effectively what you do is you start with the broadest category first, the biggest, most important idea, the defining idea, if you like, and then you whittle it down and you narrow it down and refine it and refine it and refine it until eventually you end up with the minutia. Now, there's a reason for this. In journalism, it allows you to see the big picture, and then if you're interested, you carry on delving deeper into the subject. And in this world building space, in this campaign creator series, that's exactly what we're going to be doing as well. Your players need a nice big broad overview. What makes this race more interesting than some other race, for example. Why would I want to play this race? Okay, now let me start understanding the little details. And so that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be using World Anvil throughout today's video. So let's jump straight into it. So what's the first thing? The first thing is the biggest, broadest idea has to be the magic. Now, when we're talking about magic with the Darkini, it's that choral, that, that, that choral music, that great big choir of individuals singing to create magic, whether it's necromantic magic or healing magic, doesn't matter. The idea is a choir coming together and creating this magic out of music, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful idea. So we need to start to define that. We need to give it some rules. We need to say, well, you need to have no more than this number or no less than that number. You need to have restrictions. You can't do it in this circumstance, or it requires a certain amount of time or it requires certain components. And then we need to look at, do we have any spells that we're going to be throwing in? Now, strictly speaking, this isn't necessarily applicable just to the Darkini people. Theoretically, this idea of music from song, music from a choir, it's bardic music, bardic magic, if you like. It's just on a much bigger scale, so it could be opened up to anybody else. That's why we're starting at this point. It's the broadest point, and that the Darkini are the ones that have inspired us to use this magic in our system in the first place. Let's talk more about inspiration. Professor Artuzzi.
The singularly most important thing about being creative, of course, is that it must inspire and develop upon existing ideas and not simply regurgitate the same material that's been done over and over and over again. If that is what you're going to end up doing, then why not just use the original material? It's probably better than whatever you could come up with. If you don't embellish, develop and incorporate Operated into your space, all you're going to be doing is a false mockery, and that is not creative nor inspirational, and that will come across. Your players will realize this as well, and then all you are is nothing but an empty fraud, and no one wants to be accused of that regularly. The idea of repeating stuff is very important. So when we look at the bardic spells, when we look at the bardic magic for inspiration, we have to be very, very careful of that. I completely agree with you. So let's let's now jump into actually committing this down onto paper, into our World Anvil. So here I am in the interface of World Anvil, and I'm going to create a new article. And that will bring up this page here. And what we're going to be looking at is we're going to use the template Natural Law to describe our magic. So we're going to fill in the title here, uh, Coral Mast Choir Magic. We'll have to come up with a better name for it in a little bit. Now, there's a vignette. We can put in some freeform stuff. There's a manifestation visualization. And this is what I particularly like um, in terms of, of prompting you as the game master to fill this information in. So I would say here a choir uh, begins to sing and slowly the air thickens with magic taking on strange and surreal forms coalescing into a final magical burst resulting in the spell the magic is sympathetic to the tone to the emotional tone of the music and so a sad piece of music might have shades of purple and midnight whilst a joyous celebration might be seen to be in yellow yellows and golden hues all right so just a little bit of a little bit of info just to help us talk about how it's it's actually seen um the type here we can say that it is metaphysical arcane we can choose whichever one we could call it divine this is important when we start to look at the mechanics of the system that we're using if it's arcane that gives it certain powers if it's divine it gives it certain powers if it's elemental of course it gives it other powers and there are knock-ons depending again on the system that you're using so choose one that is going to fit the best for your campaign world for your space i'm going to say in terms of where does this come from what kind of energy is this it could be psychic energy it could be supernatural energy I think I'm going to say, though, that it is psychic energy. So things that protect against psychic energy will protect against this particular type of uh, choral music. So that's something to, to bear in mind. Now, um, we need to describe the rules for this entire thing. And so let us talk about it in terms of the construction. So um, in order to perform choral music at least 10 performers are required to participate. The 10 must perform the music together and in harmony. Harmony. This requires each performer to pass a performance check DC of let's say five plus the level of the spell 
So actually, let's make this 10. So in other words, I'm using a sort of a generic idea. This is going to be for fifth edition. That's why we're saying the performance check is a DC of 10 plus the level of the spell. I know that's not how it works, but this is a whole new type of magic that we're designing. So I don't have a problem with adding in these new rules. Each performer that passes their check can contribute to the magical if magical effect all right um each spell will require a minimum number of performers as well as contain the effects of increased numbers of performers in other words if you have 10 people performing the spell will do a minimum amount of damage if you have 20 or 30 performers it will do even more damage um so then yes that's that's pretty much all that we need the spell lasts for as long as the choir performs and each chorister must make a constitution save DC of 14 each uh, no let's say every um, three minutes in order to carry on singing after the first check the second check is made with a DC of 14, uh, 15, and so on, so on, until a maximum of 12 minutes has passed. I think 12 minutes is more than enough time for a song to, to run its course, and by the tw time, of course, um, we get to 12 minutes that would be 14 at 3 15 at 6 16 at 9 so 17 at uh, 12 minutes um the spell fades the moment the singing stops all right so we've outlined that um if during the spell, choristers stop singing for whatever reason. If they reduce the number of active performers to less than 10, the spell stops so if you take out a chorister whilst they're singing the spell will stop so remember we're adding in what are restrictions what are the maximum effects what are the limits uh, and so on to to give parameters so this is broad stroke stuff so the players are going to be able to read this they're going to be able to look at this choral this um choral massed choir music magic and understand okay so we've got to have 10 people this is the check this is the duration this is this is kind of the effect and stuff all right what else do we need in order to to talk about this um well this performance where they have to make a performance check there is always or usually there's a conductor who who make sure the choir is performing well and and doing their things together can ad hoc choirs be formed i think they can i don't think we need to worry too much about that i'm just checking what else uh they're suggesting we look at here on world anvil no i think that's okay what we can do is we can now go in and they've upgraded they've now just used um they've got normal text formatting which is lovely um so tend to perform the music and harmony this requires each performer to pass a performance check of DC 10 plus, um, oh, plus the level of the spell. So let's just increase that. Okay, cool. Right, so I'm going to save this now. This is no longer a draft. Uh, it's still a work in progress. So I'm going to save that. So now we've got this, this choral mass music, and that's a very good place to start.
Okay, so as we've seen, committing this thing can be quite a process, but it can also be fairly simple. Broad strokes, remember broad strokes. So now we start to actually add in the cultural expression of the Darkini people. We start to bring it to life, and that requires us to then look and say, okay, well, the racial influence, that's the Zulu influence. In broad strokes, it's part, part number one. The Zulu influence is the beaded culture, the idea of the one warrior, many wives, the MP kind of system. We're to add all of that into the pot we're also going to add in though the flavor that gets added by having cat folk and we spoke about that briefly before replacing cattle with fish or with these little private ponds and things that represent the wealth of the individual uh, we're going to add in that kind of stuff into the mix to make it feel more appropriate to the two we're then going to look at the magical influence so with the choirs requiring 10 individuals or more, that number 10 is going to be quite important. Numbers should be quite important. Music should be quite important. Do we need to add in some rules about you can't sing on your own or you can't tap out a beat for fear of raising the dead? Those kinds of things we need to look at. And then we also need to look at the geography. Now, I know Swift was very, very adamant about this, and so was Avid. The geography helps to find the people, too. So what do the Great Plains offer? What do they bring to this culture? Are they going to be riding mounts? Now, traditionally, the Zulus didn't. They just simply ran from point A to point B. But there are other cultures who grew up on the Great Plains, and they had horses. Would the Darkini have the same idea? Way back when, at the very beginning, of this series, I had an image of a Zulu warrior with a saber-toothed tiger. If that is now replaced with a Darkini cat, would they domesticate other feline-based races in their employ? Those are things we've got to look at. So we've got to look at the main influence from our broad stroke, the music, and then we've got to look at non-magical things. Now to talk more about this, who else? Mr. Battenborough. Most cultures will be influenced by certain traditions that have evolved over time within the actual individuals involved in the space, as well as the geography. We must take into account the type of environment that the individuals find themselves in and the pressures that they place upon said individuals. When there is not a lot of pressure, generally speaking, then there is an excess of creativity. We can see this in terms of development of writing once there was more time available to actually commit down what was being produced versus the daily struggle of hunter-gatherer life. It is these subtle changes in the amount of time available to the individual that often will determine the complexity as well as the duration of events and activities and ceremonies that will happen within a specific culture. Always look to where the time of the individual is spent most and then you will understand where and how important other things that are not to deal with life and death fit. Weaving theme into this whole space, I think, is absolutely critical. And, of course, it's about what do we want to say in our adventure. Yes, we're creating this culture. Yes, we're creating this world, but we're creating it for a reason. So let's make sure that that reason is expressed in the culture then as well. Why not? So then when we go to converting the idea in terms of specifics, what specifically stuck out for us, or should I say stuck into us, as a matter of fact, that ikwa, that spear, death. Definitely, definitely came through as something of uniqueness. It even features in the game Civilization VI. The Zulu King Shaka actually talks about the Ikwa as a, a sort of a thing. It's like the Rhodes and Romans, I suppose, the Ikwa and the Zulus. So we're going to look at that. We want to include that very specifically because it is a cultural point. This, there could be many that we add in for the sake of the video. However, we're only going to unpack just how to do just this one section. So we're going to look at the actual Ikwa itself. We're going to change its name. The Ikwa, requiring that click, is prohibitively difficult to pronounce to anyone who's not used to putting it in the middle of a sentence. So maybe we need to change up the name. We need to look at the stats. And we need to look at the value that it's bringing. Definitely someone to answer this. And a new individual on the channel, I have to say, welcome to Centurion Singulari, who's going to talk about weaponry while while Bjorn is sailing across the oceans. No, no, I'm afraid he's not here yet. The centurion 
hasn't yet arrived. No, and neither has Borg. So I, they've asked me to fill in the gap. We're talking um, sort of improve our our offerings in terms of the statistics of that awful weapon. I think the bottom line is that whenever you are adding something to your arsenal, as long as it's different enough that it isn't just a carbon copy of something else, because otherwise, rarely, if it's got the same values as as something else, it, it really is just something else. It's not actually adding to anything. So w- when you're statting things out, you suddenly draw inspiration from and try and work within the parameters of the system that you are using. So, for example, this this um, Iklwa, um thing, spear, you know, it, it, it's a short sword on a stick. So what does that really mean in terms of statistics and value? Within the framework, it shouldn't do more damage necessarily than a long sword, which is really just a short sword with a bit of extra length, and it shouldn't do less damage than an actual short sword because it's on a stick. What does the stick actually do? What what advantage does it give the the, the short sword? So perhaps one might want to look at it something along those lines. But if if it is just a short sword statistically according to your system, then it isn't it's not really worth including. It, it becomes more administrative uh, dogma than than anything else. Um, so yes, what what exactly, if I might ask, is an ikloa? I'm not sure. Um, I know it's a sword on a stick. We're now going to jump straight into World Anvil to fill out the stat block so that you can have a look and see what tools are provided to help you on your journey in terms of committing everything down onto paper. Okay, I've switched back to the Create tab. We're going to create the Iqua weapon now. And um, for that, we could use technology uh, if we if we wanted to do so, or we could choose item. I'm going to go with item. It's a rather interesting thing. It's a unique item. We're going to call it... Well, we're not going to call it the Iqua because that's very difficult to pronounce if you're not used to doing the clicks and sounds and things. Um, so let's change that up. We're going to call it, um, these are tabaxi. Um, let's call it the, let's see, let's see. Equa, e, the quarry, a quarry spear. How about that? There we go. Okay. And technically it would be the quarry stabbing spear which, if we want it to be easier to remember, is the Darkini, actually. Because the Darkini, then we know, okay, it's a Darkini stabbing spear. Like, it would be the Zulu stabbing spear rather than the Ikwa. So it helps, it makes life a little bit easier. Is it taking away from the originality? Is it taking away from the atmosphere of it? It could very well be. And if a player wants to play a Darkini, you can say to them, well, you come up with a name for the spear because it's not going to be called the Darkini stabbing spear by the Darkini. Uh, but it is what it is okay so um again we've got some vignette writing we've got some notes for ourselves that's not particularly what we're interested in. what we're interested in here is the weight the weight of one of these spears they're actually quite heavy they're not as broad as you might think they are they're still a long 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 blade um i would say they probably weigh around about let's say three pounds give or take this is sometimes useful information the uh, dimensions well the blade is um just over one and a half feet uh, where's my backslash one and a half feet long and the shaft is just two feet in length Okay, now when it comes to base price, this is the important thing. You've got to compare it to other things in your world. So it's a similar to a short sword. Short swords cost 10 gold pieces each. Now, a short sword has got quite a lot of things going into it. It's got a hilt, it's got a handle, it's got the pommel, as well as it's got the blade. This this Darkini stabbing spear, thrusting spear, doesn't have a lot of that. It's a wooden shaft and then just the blade tip. So I think it behooves us to make it slightly cheaper. So let's make it eight gold pieces per spear. So that's, that's slightly cheaper, which is quite good. Um, it is rarely found outside of the Darkini controlled territories. When found outside of the Great Plains, 
is often as a hunting trophy rather rather than as a weapon okay significance each darkini warrior is awarded their own thrusting spear when they are accepted into the warrior caste of their tribe okay mechanics and inner workings now this is where we talk about the the weapon itself so we're going to look at the the darkini thrusting spear and we are going to say um that the damage damage is 1d6 i'm going to say here plus one that shaft allows it to really be pushed quite a distance to make it quite strong so i'm going to do that and then i'm going to say the type is uh piercing but it doesn't have the finesse that a uh, dnd short sword would have and i've got the stats open on the uh, tab next door it doesn't have all of those wonderful things it is just that it is a spear designed to cause damage so it does 1d6 plus one and it's piercing damage it's as simple as that does that make it different from the short sword it's cheaper than the sword short sword short it does more damage than the short sword but it can't be used as a finesse weapon it's it requires you to focus on what you're doing so there is the advantage and there is the disadvantage this then would be the only weapon in the particular arsenal that has this basic value. So you're looking at a damage output of two to seven, an average of four. That's not bad for a, a simple kind of weapon. It, it, without stats and things, it outperforms the short sword. There's no doubt about that by one point. I think that that's more than sufficient in terms of creating a unique enough weapon that that's why we want it. Now, we can go in here and we can talk about the construction of it. So it's a wooden shaft uh, leading to a metal um, blade that comprises the entire spear. Okay, uh, tooling, machining process, manufacturing process, we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, type, this is a weapon, uh, weapon, and it is a melee weapon. We, you know, we can really dig down deep into this if we wanted to make subtypes and that sort of thing, manufacturer. Uh, if we had um, Darkini, we could add that in related text and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could do a new um, article. We could say uh, the Darkini which uh, we've now just created a new link, uh, a new article, and it will be there ready for us to go and work on as we so need. Now, localization again, if we wanted to choose a specific geographic point, if we had maps loaded up, we could certainly load that in as well. And here we write the Darkini stabbing spear is made specifically for young Dar Darkini who have passed their trials and have joined the warrior caste within the tribe. The short shaft made of dark wood is tipped with a long bladed blade forming the entire spear. It is designed for stabbing exclusively and cannot be thrown with any great accuracy. There we go. And we're going to take that out of draft. We're going to save the changes. We could look and see whether or not the um, players respond to this weapon or not. Is it unique enough? Well, it's, it's doing what it's doing. It's creating a little bit of flavor. And that's all that it needs to do. It isn't just repeating what a short sword does either, which I think is also important.
And that's it. That's the process that we will be following for the rest of our conversion of the Darkini onto actual paper. We can come back and racially stat out the Darkini themselves, the feline race. We could just use the Tabaxi template if we're playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Whatever system you're playing in, it doesn't really matter. You can now start to flesh it out and build from this very solid base. You've got the idea of the music. You've got the idea of some unique items. We could then start to look at how would we express the food, that particular beer, the Amasi, all those kinds of wonderful things, and how we would convert the names from Zulu into Darkini and into something that is perhaps a little bit more appropriate to the people that we're playing with. All of that comes together and it gives us this final, final picture of the Darkini people committed down to paper and now we can start to play with this race in our world with confidence because it's all there and we can now add to it. I think that is my parting thought to you. Do not assume that the culture once committed to paper is done. Never, 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 never assume that. It's going to grow, and as a player wants to play the Darkini, they might have questions. They might say, what's the name of the leader of a village? What's the Darkini name? I want to know. Is it Mfundisi? Is it uh, Bas? What is it? What is it? What, what is the name? Where does it come from? That is where you let the player start to add information, and then you update your data sheets, your storage receptacle, world anvilatium, whatever you want to call it. That's where you then start to build and flesh out. So don't be afraid to advance and evolve your culture over your games, and to not have to worry about having everything down on paper. Let it grow. Discover it over time. Don't rush it. That's what I have to say to you this week as we convert the culture into something usable. Until next time, however, next week we've got a little bit of fun, which I hope you will enjoy. And then thereafter, we are off to the land of the rising sun as we look at the Japanese for inspiration for our next cultural conversion. Until then, however, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to be reminded when these videos come out. The little goblin bell is right there for you to bang on so that you can get an alert when new videos are coming out. Just a reminder, we're now doing live shows on Sunday, Sunday evening, 7 p.m. GMT. So wherever you are in the world, work it out from that. 7 p.m. GMT for one hour live show answering your questions about role playing. So come on over, come and join the conversation. We had a great time last week. This week promises to be as much fun, if not more fun. Until then, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming. Thank you very much, my lord. You know, it's important, as far as I'm concerned, that you shouldn't ever forget about the little people. I mean, after all, we do all the work and we make sure that everything gets done and... I might have forgotten to make sure that everything gets done. So I hope you like the video and I'll see you again next week. Um, right. Wife, I might have forgotten to feed the dragon. <laughs>